Hey midsole manglers and outsole adventurers, Ed Vibro Champ Bud here. Today I'm ranking all of Nike's daily running shoes released in 2021. Welcome to my strange corner of the internet. Thanks for joining us today guys, it's much appreciated. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button and click the bell below for notifications of when we launch those new videos for you. Today I'm ranking some of Nike's daily running shoes that they've released in 2021. I'm only going to rank stuff that I've actually tried. I think it's ridiculous to rank things I haven't tried on foot and I put a reasonable number of miles into all of the shoes. I haven't just bought them, ran three miles in them and sent them back to the company. I have purchased all of these as well and there's no freebies here. These are my honest opinions for you as always. So four shoes in today's comparison, let's dive in. Just in terms of pricing on these four, I've noticed that Nike have increased the retail price of each of the shoes in today's comparison. It's only about five pounds increase from the original retail prices, but it has to be noted. The Pegasus 38 comes in at the cheapest at 105 Earth Credits UK. We then have the Vomero 16, which is 135 Earth Credits Credits, followed by the Infinity Run Flyknit 2 at 140 and the big one, 160 Earth credits for the Nike Invincible Run Flyknit. So those are the prices that I've paid and that I'll refer to in my review today. So I'm going to rank these in terms of upper, midsole, outsole and value. I'm going to give a score out of four. So there'll be effectively four positions, four points for the top place and one point for the bottom. We'll start with the uppers first. There were things I liked about the Invincible Run Flyknit, but sadly one of those was not the upper. It has the bottom place for upper with one point. I mean, a shoe that gave me blisters. I never get blisters in any of the running shoes I've tried, aside from the Adidas Ultra Boost 20. No other shoe has given me blisters aside from this one. A few people I noticed on some forum somewhere mentioned it's because I had the wrong size. This is a size 11, which is normally what I have for a Nike. And I've got about a thumb's width of distance between my foot and the end of the shoe. So it's not that. I just felt it was a bit overbuilt. I just wanted less upper. And it's still something I might experiment with while I've got a few hours of spare time over the summer. Get my hacksaw out and cut away some of the padding, see if it improves it. The Infinity Run Flyknit 2 was a serviceable enough upper, though unlike any other Flyknit I've experienced. I never really felt the stability elements that are built into the shoe at all. One thing I did note though was the quite present arch here. It really does cut into the side of your foot and thus if you have a wider foot, I don't think the Infinity Run Flying It 2 is going to work all that well for you. I think they should have perhaps aimed at something that was between the first version and this one by including something similar to what was on the original version of the shoe, but including those flywire cables as well to improve the upper fit, just to maximise the lockdown a little bit. That was the main problem people had with the shoe. So two points for the Infinity Run Flying It 2. The Pegasus and the Vomero both have slightly more refined uppers with better fit than the other two shoes in today's comparison. There's little in it between these two. I'd perhaps err on the side of the Vomero 16. It's just that little bit more comfortable over the top of the foot. I feel in the Vomero 16, it's slightly easier to dial in the lace tension over the top of the foot. And it doesn't feel quite so thick in the toe box. So I think I'll probably give the four points to the Vomero 16 and three points to the Pegasus 38. It's just something about this shoe. It feels a little bit more breathable to me certainly in the warmer summer months. Midsole, 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 midsole now. I gotta be honest, I quite like the midsole in all of these shoes for different reasons, but I have to rank them, so here goes. I think bottom with one point, it's gotta be the comfortable but serviceable, I suppose, Infinity Run Flying It 2. It's sort of middle of the road stuff. Maybe like a James Blunt album of a midsole. I'm sorry if you like James Blunt, but I just find him a little bit too middle of the road for my tastes. Absolutely fine for daily stuff at steady paces. Ultimately, the React midsole here makes for a reasonable daily type shoe but i think the others are that bit better the pegasus 38's got a little more pop due to that air zoom bag in the forefoot they come across as similar weights here but this one isn't anywhere near as tight in the arch i have to say though that the react here does feel a little denser perhaps than that featured in the Infinity Run Flying It 2. I just found this one a bit more nimble and capable of a wider range of paces than the Infinity Run Flying It 2. So we'll give two points in terms of midsole to the Pegasus 38. I told you I like some things about the Invincible Run, and that is the midsole. I really enjoyed the full Zoomex slab that you get underfoot. I just felt a bit sad though, because it was attached to that terrible upper. It's got brilliant forgiving fatigue lessening properties. 
which is what everybody needs. And I think that's probably enough for me to give it a second place here, three points. I got up to some reasonably fast paces here, though I did feel as if I was squashing into the midsole at times at those faster clips. That leaves top position with four points to the Vomero 16. A great balance of cushion, impact protection, and propulsion from that air zoom unit. I gotta be honest, I absolutely love the midsole in the Vomero 16. I did a really fast 5K with some warm up and cool down earlier, but Something makes me want to go out and do another few miles in this one, even though I've got a busy night ahead. That's how much I love the midsole here. It's a strange marshmallowy mystery with that odd foam from the Joyride shoe from last year. The Zoom X Core of Grail-like squash. And it comes out as the lightest of all four shoes in today's comparison. I expect to see more of this Adidas style combination of foams in Nike shoes as we move forward into 2022. It seems to work exceptionally well for the swoosh in this one, and I hope to see them experimenting more by mixing the foams up. So the Vomero 16 is top cat for midsole. We're at the halfway point and here's the scores. So the Infinity Run Flyknit 2 is in fourth position with three points. In third position, we have the Invincible Run with four points. In second, we have the Pegasus 38 with five points. And top at the halfway point, is the Vomero 16 with eight points. Out sole now. Out soles next. And almost all the shoes in today's video are solid performers in the underfoot rubber department. A tough call, but I need to try to pull them apart. I think in last position, it's the Infinity Run Flyknit. The lower depth to the lugs here, I think, holds the shoe back a little bit. Just isn't quite as secure as you'd want on wet pavement conditions or light trail running either. I wouldn't take it on that. So only one point for this one. Doesn't mean to say it's a bad shoe. I just think that the others are that bit better. Now, I've got to be honest, it was reasonably durable as well, so. We have a joint second place here between the Invincible Run and the Pegasus 38. You have to say the Invincible Run is superb in terms of outsole lug frequency. It did appear to wear down a little bit quickly in certain areas, but grip on practically every surface is superb. In fact, I think you could even run on some dirt roads in this one without any real problem. Very strange outsole this one, but yeah, it's worthy of 2.5 points. 2.5 points also for the Pegasus 38. Superb in the mid to forefoot. I just feel it lacks a little bit with that large outsole cutout here, which means I think it's a little less usable on light trails. Need a bit more surface area there. Great on concrete though, or road. And the outsole rubber is almost too durable here. There's almost no wear whatsoever after 100 miles. They could consider perhaps reducing the depth of those rubber lugs. That would also have the effect of reducing the weight of the shoe as well. Top spot for me though is the ELO style outsole on the Vomero 16. Full coverage rubber here with hints of all of the other shoes in there. You've got lugs similar to that on the Pegasus 38. Tempo next percent style fins in the heel. And I found it works brilliantly on practically everything that I've tested it on so far. A mixture of loads of different Nike shoes here in the outsole and it's a resounding success. So four points for the Vomero 16 in terms of outsole. Value wise, I'm gonna take into account durability of the shoe, the retail price, and also its versatility got to consider them all very carefully. I found the Invincible Run a tad overpriced when you take into account the whole package. The underfoot foam in the midsole was superb, but there are cheaper options out there if you just want all out cushion. I mean, 160 pounds is a lot of money to spend out for quite a heavy shoe that's overbuilt. That aside, it is a great recovery shoe, but do you want to pay that much for a recovery shoe? So one point for the Invincible Run on value. I mean, if you could have the Infinity Run upper on the Invincible Run midsole, then that would be great, but that's not a thing. Slightly cheaper, but you'll certainly get a lot of miles out of this one. I mean, React is really durable, but again, it just lacks that pop for me in the midfoot to really do some faster paced efforts. So I'll probably give this one one point also. The Vomero 16 at 135 Earth credit seems very versatile so far. All I have left to do in this shoe is my long run. We'll see how it holds up. I think it's worthy of second place today. I think that Pegasus 38 is just really hard to beat in terms of versatility, but a more affordable price. I mean, we're not talking race shoes here. We're talking work horse daily trainers. You want something that's pretty much capable of doing most things relatively well, as durable as a tractor. Whilst not the lightest, I'm gonna give this the four points for value. It's easily the cheapest of the four shoes today. 
and readily available. It ticks lots of boxes. That's what I'm trying to say. So final scores on the Vidi printer. So in fourth place, we have the Infinity Run Flyknit 2 with five points. In third, it's the Invincible Run Flyknit with 7.5 points. Second position is the Pegasus 38 with 10.5 points. And top spot today is the Vomero 16 with 15 points. So I'm not really that surprised at my final scores here. And you know I like a versatile shoe. I think the Pegasus 38 and the Vomero are similar in some ways. Yeah, I feel if you don't like React Foam, then the Vomero is the way to go. If React Foam isn't a problem to you, you want some daily shoe that's gonna grind out the miles, the Pegasus is great as well. It's that little bit cheaper, but I feel that the Vomero 16 actually, a little bit extra cost, is that bit of a better shoe. I think it's a real all-rounder and the benefits that you get from the extra cost are worth it in the long run. No pun intended. What do you make of my comparison today, guys? A bit of fun, really, you know? I've got a lot of miles into these shoes, so I know them well. I consulted my notes over time, looked back through Strava, how I felt on some of the runs. Well, I think the scores are about as honest as you get. If you've experienced these shoes, let me know what you make of them down in the comments. A quick musical interlude for you. Where I've been getting the fingers moving again and back to race speed on the guitar, that is, I had to dig out the Black and White Knight from Roy Orbison. Now, the special thing about this fantastic live recording is the fact that Roy Orbison's got loads of really famous and exceptional players in his backing band on this one. It's like they handpicked some of the best people you could possibly think of. Elvis Costello's there, you've got Bruce Springsteen, or at least a very young Bruce there. But it's the inclusion of James Burton as well on guitar that really pushes this one over the edge. Some of his playing on this is just exceptional. If you like that sort of country rock style. The man produces exceptional tones from his Telecaster. Some of the best bits can be heard on a extended long version of Oh Pretty Woman, where there's a duel between Bruce Springsteen and James Burton. And well, you know who wins. Orbison's voice sounds exceptional on this one as well. Sounds so full, so effortless. And he always has that air of mystery around him as well with the dark glasses and that beautiful 335 guitar as well that he's playing. Definitely go and check this out guys. If you've never heard any Roy Orbison before, then you're really missing out. The Black and White Knight by Roy Orbison. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video today, guys. It's always appreciated. If you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button and click the bell below for notifications when we roll out those new videos for you. If you enjoyed the video today, please help the channel out by giving it a thumbs up like and also sharing it with your running buddies. My name's Ed Budd and I'll be seeing you.